Um, I'd like to say thank you to ASPE for giving me the opportunity here to uh, chair this session on uh, project management. Uh, this is a, uh, a topic that's very near to my heart, and I believe it's critical to the success of any large, long-term, complex industrial endeavor, which certainly the future submarine program is or will be. Um, all three of our speakers for the project management session today are well known in the Australian submarine community. Um, first, we'll have Mr. David Gould. Uh, as uh, DMO's general manager for uh, submarines, uh, David is responsible for all the material related aspects of submarine support for Australia's existing submarine fleet and the future submarine. Uh, he's, uh, he's going to provide a view from the top on uh, the aspects of the Australian submarine enterprise as he sees them. Um, he has extensive UK and international senior leadership experience managing large and complex projects such as the UK aircraft carrier program, the Type 45 destroyer program, and the astute class project uh, restructure over the years. Um, last night I had the opportunity to mention to David that the um, industry team is keen to understand the topic that was broached yesterday and hinted at today by Mark Thompson uh, regarding the uh, near-term uh, consultation period the Commonwealth intends to have with industry uh, regarding the formation of an enduring submarine enterprise uh, to carry the future submarine project from prelim pre uh, preliminary design through all phases of the project, including future sustainment. And I'm sure we're all hoping to hear more about that today. So with that, David, the stage is yours. <clears throat> Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, quite a few people, both this morning and last night, have kind of been, and, and John just now, have been offering trailers as to what I was going to say, um, rather close to the point of delivery. So I've got myself involved in something you shouldn't be involved in in project management, which is a sort of design and production overlap of fairly large proportions. <laughs> so um, <coughs> if, uh, if I get a bit disjointed at some point, um, uh, please, please bear with me. Um, I want to talk a bit about strategic projects. Um, I want to give a bit of an overview of where I think we, we, we are. Uh, and I will talk a bit about industry consultation and um, make an inroad or two into Mark Thompson's questions, but I'm certainly not going to give you definitive answers to them for some time to come. Uh, but we'll come to that later. So um, here we go. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, continuous production. So here we go. This is a really good example of continuous production. This is Hussein. Um, I met him in Zanzibar about 10 years ago. And uh, he and his family have been building boats in Zanzibar for about 100 years. And um, when you say, how long does it take to build a boat? He says, it takes six months. And I said, how do you know? Because it took my father six months. It took my grandfather six months. And how much does it cost? And he said, same price my father, same price my grandfather. So this guy is, is a hero for national audit offices all over the world because his products come out on time and on cost every single time. So anyone draw back, you get a wooden fishing die. But if you're happy with that, then he's the man to go to for sure. But for strategic programs, um, we're at the other end of the spectrum completely. And um, I'd like to start by just considering what, what are the things that might make a project strategic. And I think the the clue lies, and the Chief of Navy referred to this yesterday, the clue lies in the intended effect. It's not just a tactical effect. It's actually the effect that produces or maintains a fundamental shift in an adversary's calculation about their freedom of action or about the consequences of an act they might take. And therefore, it might persuade them to desist from doing it and change course. And strategic programs are likely to be, in my view, lengthy and expensive, and they will involve significant technological challenge. And here's why. Th this is some old research, so it's not the figures, it's the shape of the curve that matters. It's plotting uh, advantage in military effect on the vertical axis against spend on R&D on the horizontal axis. Don't worry about where the countries sit on this curve, because some of the countries on there have been taking peace dividends several times since this, uh, this graph was plotted, and therefore they're slipping back down the other way. Um, the, the importance of this is this, that if you are doing research and development to produce an effect, but it takes you, say, 
15 or more years to produce the artifact that contains that research and development, then there's a big time lag between the research you do and actually getting your military effect. And it actually works in reverse as well. If you stop doing the R&D, then it's only as you change your generations of equipment that you really start to see the fall off in capability that comes with the same thing. So when you're dealing with a strategic program, I shall argue, you are dealing with these very long-term changes in technology and capability uh, that produce the effect that you're looking for. And the need to produce strategic effect necessarily circumscribes the capabilities trade space, but that, I shall also argue, absolutely does not obviate the need for rigid requirement discipline when doing projects of this nature. In fact, absolutely the opposite. It also means that um, the project is likely to be driven by time because part of the strategic imper imperative derives from timely implementation. In other words, schedule will be right at the heart of the project, not something you can pick and choose. And the technological element is going to contain some uh, challenging features because strategic effect is most often conferred in part at least by some closely guarded and very advanced, ad advanced science and technology. And finally, what you're doing has to be credible. It must be underpinned by determination at the very center of government. I'd like to briefly illustrate this uh, by reference to a project with which I had a fleeting acquaintance in the 1970s known as Chevelin. Chevelin was um, <coughs> part of the deterrent system uh, carried by the resolution class SSBNs on the US Polaris missile with the UK built nuclear warhead uh, from the late 60s, early 70s and right through until the Vanguard class came into service with the Trident system in the early 90s. Because of limited numbers of missiles and warheads, the decision for the UK government at the time was taken that to have strategic effect, you had to be able to hold at risk the key aspects of Soviet state power. You had to keep their government really worried about their own survival against an attack on Moscow. Um, in the late 60s, it became clear that the ABM system, anti-ballistic missile system around Moscow, uh, was coming to such a point that the probability of successful attack was too low for credible deterrence, deterrence. And that left the UK government with um, two choices. They could either buy a lot more new submarines and missiles and build more warheads and try and saturate the system, or they could try and defeat it through decoys and countermeasures. Uh, and of course, uh, for good economic reasons, um, chose the latter. Uh, and what Chevalier actually did was reduce the number of warheads per missile and use the space and weight gained to install decoys and a warhead bus that was in fact a maneuverable, sophisticated spacecraft. And this was really quite a challenge for a country which at that time and still did not have a spacecraft program or industry. So we had to exploit the scientific and technology and research base that we had and ally that to the engineering that we found in one or two specialized companies to produce something which we had never actually done before. Uh, and in fact, as a side product of that, we actually understood how to defeat ballistic missile defenses quite well at the end of this and um, were able to contribute quite, um, quite usefully to President Reagan's strategic defense initiative later on, but that's another story. The other thing about Chevalier is that it was carried out in great secrecy. And the reason it was carried out in great secrecy was not to hide it from the Russians. They needed to know we were doing something like this. Uh, it was to hide it from the other part of the Labour Party because the Labour government <laughs> didn't want to have an internal debate about what we were doing. I, I'm not advocating great secrecy for a uh, huge submarine program. I merely point out that uh, great secrecy is not necessarily incompatible with project success. Um, what this illustrates is a number of features for strategic programs. They will contain sophisticated technology challenge and a lot of risk, but it's really important that you bound that risk to the thing that really matters, not to things that are peripheral to producing the effect. They will need to exploit a national technology base, but that technology base also needs to be used to give credentials for worthwhile cooperation with other partners. Science and engineering and specialized industrial resource has to be pooled. It's an enterprise effort. And it's likely to be driven by a time imperative and by an imperative from the center of government. 
So how does Australia's future submarine stack up against these strategic criteria? So we're not talking about SSBNs, so we can leave that to one side. But we heard yesterday from Baram Samet and from others about the strategic exploitation of submarine capability. For an SSK or an SSN even operated independently from ballistic missile force, strategic uh, effect depends on how you're going to operate it. And as we heard, that means you have to use it offensively, up threat, so it can seriously inhibit what an adversary might want to do. If you use it defensively, you leave the adversary with the initiative and that takes away your strategic effect. And that poses some very serious capability demands. In Australia's case, we've heard a lot about range and endurance, but stealth and the tactical combat system together are the things that confer survivability and superiority when they're in the theater of operations. And those two things, survivability and superiority, are inseparable. Without those two, the utility of the boat is severely circumscribed. It simply won't be put in harm's way in the way in which you want to use it. But these technologies themselves are the crown jewels of submarine design, and they are not things which can easily be shared or indeed should easily be shared. They're even quite difficult to talk about in some circumstances. So Australia needs a credible science and technology base for its own purpose and to establish its credentials with potential capability partners. Other nations will not lift the skirt on parts of their crown jewels to a partner who is not able to understand, protect, and exploit their value. So part of it is not just enabling us to understand and do things that we need to do, it's also becoming a credible partner to others. And we're fortunate that Australia does have an industrial base and a science base in DSTO and its associates with some world-class technologies. And working together with the uh, team in Adelaide, we're increasingly able to demonstrate some real credibility to our close ally allies. And that isn't just our judgment, it's also their judgment, uh, supported by the peer, peer review, which you've heard about, led by NAVC from the United States, and increasingly with other counterparts. I should explain a bit more about the, uh, the IPT. Simon did that yesterday, but clearly talking to people in the break periods and over dinner last night, some of what Simon said was news, so it worth repeating, or bears repeating briefly. So what's it doing? It's not designing a submarine. Okay. Uh, with parts of DSTO and DMO and the Navy and others, it is the focus of Australia's submarine technology and understanding in preparation for the future submarine program and with growing close relations with industry, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second. And its core function is undertaking initial concept design. That is to explore the interaction of capability, cost, and executability, bearing in mind the critical capability requirements which would make future submarine strategic. And that is not, again, about designing the most elaborate SSK conceivable. On the contrary, it's about a sophisticated understanding of how elements of design interact with cost, capability equation to get the optimum outcome. And then setting the design and project management arrangements to control and assure the design process through build, and in particular, at the transition points between concept, preliminary design, detailed design, and into construction. Those are the points where latent risk is most likely to emerge if it's not attended to and well understood. It may, for example, be necessary in order to keep control of design and build to accept a greater level of capability trade in early boats of the class and improve boats later. Several speakers have referred to the fact that growth in detection technology will happen over time and therefore it means the design actually can't stand still. What we must not do is attempt to modify design when it's already mature or even worse, during build, and therefore proceed into build with an immature or unstable project. Nor is what the team doing about predetermining the procurement route. Um, the procurement route, the disciplines that the project team is, is undertaking and applying will be required whatever procurement route is taken. And even if we find it possible to achieve the outcome by adapting an already relatively mature design, and there's no such thing, as Steve Ludlam said earlier, as a simple adaptation of a submarine design. 
but clearly, where there are proven and contemporary elements of design suitable for reuse, that is a significant opportunity for risk reduction. But even in that case, the disciplines described need to be uh, applied. And that's why we should not, in Australia, in my view, shy away from being involved in design. Problems don't arise from doing design well. Problems arise from pretending design is mature when it's not, or that changes can be introduced without consequence in terms of cost and schedule. It sounds obvious, but it happens, and I've seen it happen in both public and private sector. So rigid discipline over management of the design, once the key parameters have been set, is going to be essential. Design margins are there to manage design. They are not there for someone else to consume with new ideas and new capability. We must also use the design process to make sure that the build strategy gives us the best opportunity to exploit efficient construction techniques, but not, again, as Steve Ludlam said, at the cost of maintainability. For this reason, the builder and maintainer, the prospective builder and maintainer, must be involved in design. They might be the same person, but they must be involved in design from the early stages. So the overall enterprise will need to take shape early, which is why we shall be embarking upon a formal process of industry consultation concurrent with the developing concept design. We lack in Australia contemporary experience of turning design strategies we are now developing into an executable program for detailed design and build. An experience of doing that is gold dust in this particular field. Um, so care will need to be taken when we do consultation, which is not solicitation, that at the first stage, the consultation does not become de facto selection. We are doing it, the purpose of it is to prepare for later solicitation, which probably will happen next year. So, the Australian submarine enterprise, as it is today, is shown on this slide, and also how it needs to develop for future submarine. I spoke earlier about the growth of core technical expertise in Australia, but this does not yet comprise the experience levels, which are growing fast, but doesn't yet comprise the experience levels necessary to produce the intelligent customer organization. And what do I mean by that? Well, its functions basically include to be accountable to defense and government for the execution of the program, that includes letting the contracts, to make the critical design calls and where appropriate, give government authorita authoritative advice on them. It needs to act as the design approving authority for the future submarine and provide safety certification for the submarine throughout its life. These are some of the functions that it will need to um, fulfill. And doing that with the appropriate level of skill and 170 odd people that uh, we heard about earlier, it sounds about, about right, is going to challenge assumptions which are cherished in some places in this city about how people are recruited and contracted into the public service. Given today's constraints, I cannot conceive that such a body can be entirely homegrown, although one would hope that a substantial part of it could be homegrown from the DMO and from Navy. But ignoring that problem means we would be delegating to an outside body a commercial supplier or a foreign government, the important cost, capability, and design choices. And we should not do that for a strategic project. So this slide summarizes some of the, in an idealized form, the attributes we're looking for for the lead commercial entity to actually execute the detailed design and build program of it. The industry people here today will have views about where you fit into this. Uh, I, my view is that we should be extremely fortunate to find all these in one place, um, but we don't exclude anything at this point. Uh, it is in part, of course, design dependent, so it's early to be, too early to be picking on winners at the moment. And we need to have people that we will be comfortable sharing the most sensitive features of our capability with to some degree. So we shall be involved in some enterprise building. The answer is not obvious at all as it stands at the moment. And at the same time, we need to develop some commercial models for the project's execution. Among those will be included the intended roles for private capital, for example, in supporting plants and infrastructure, and contractual models for baking in continuous productivity improvements, which will be a condition of the project proceeding uh, into the program at appropriate stages. We're about to start a formal process, as indicated, 
We think we know who you might be, and we will be in touch with you. But bear with us, uh, we can't talk to everybody all at the same time. So wait, wait, to, be, wait to be contacted. Uh, Mark Thompson earlier this morning had some, uh, some very good questions, which we plan to answer, but not today. Um, however, it's not too early to be thinking about them, and I thought I'd just share one or two thoughts, um, make some inroads into, into where he came from. But first of all, in terms of cost control, as I've described, the design process itself is critical, actually, in determining the cost of the submarine. The potential cost of the submarine depends on what you design. But the commercial arrangements will actually be the incentivization of the execution of the project and will definitely have to change as we go through different stages. There is no one commercial arrangement or one commercial construct that will take us all the way through all stages of the project. Fixed prices. My experience with several projects that seeking fixed prices before risk is well understood by all parties and can be rationally allocated usually makes for trouble. Uh, and when it makes for trouble, it's government that picks up the bill. So it's much better to do it when you're ready and not when you're uh, not prematurely. It has been known to work, but mostly it doesn't. So we shouldn't do it. And it may well be, depending on where we construct the submarine and who constructs the submarine, that we could be well towards completion of the first boat before you're able to fix the price of a first batch. That could be the case, it might not be the case. Um, so um, allocating commercial risk as you go through the different stages will be a very, very tricky thing to do and need to be done with enormous skill and enormous understanding. We are looking for an enduring enterprise. Um, that is to say, a return coming from a long-term enduring commitment to the overall submarine program uh, not from a quick return on selling an individual component. So at the top tier level, we're looking for somebody who wants to be in that kind of business. So this is not a place for venture capitalists. Um, but however, as in something of an unreconstructed Thatcherite, um, I'm a great believer in the power of capital and power of the commercial incentive. And so, uh, Mark, ownership structure and capital structure will be very important considerations in this. Company governance is not entirely compatible with complete transparency, so there's a bit of tension there between public expectations of transparency and the way companies actually operate. Um, and finally, uh, just a comment that um, problems in projects that arise late um, are not discovered by auditors. Auditors have access to the same information as companies. It's how companies actually react to the information they're getting that actually produces or don't react to it that produces the late-breaking problem. So we will be addressing those and the resourcing and the mobilization aspects during the consultation process, and it won't be until into next year that we actually get into a solicitation process. So we are not selecting, we are seeking to understand and construct an industrial and commercial construct at this point. And finally, um, I mentioned that um, strategic projects usually have a time imperative, and this one is clearly no exception. In my view, some extension of Colin's life is inevitable, but that is no pretext whatsoever for delay in making progress on future submarine. The decision timescales hinted at by the minister or suggested by the minister yesterday are on the critical path for avoiding a capability gap, so there is not time to lose. However, the Coles Phase 4 review gives some confidence that we know what we're about in managing Collins and indeed in extending its life. But neither is free from what John called a more than routine level of risk. Life extension for submarines is usually feasible. Designers normally build in significant through life margin, but preserving or recovering some of the other margins on um, power, cooling, stability is often very challenging. So it won't be easy, but I don't see any obvious reason why it can't be done. So we should be able to get there. So Aspie, thank you for the opportunity to get some of these things off my chest. Um, I noted the title uh, Submarine Choice with interest. Um, unlike what often happens in defense procurement, this is one of those capabilities, and it usually is with a strategic project, where we actually have to cause the choice we want to be created. It isn't waiting for us out there. So thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, David, for those comments. Um, our next speaker is Mr. John Coles. Um, as we all know, he is the uh, leader of the Coles Review Team, uh, which has been referenced numerous times during this conference, and which provided the uh, impetus for the recent much improved operational availability of the Collins fleet. Uh, John has a long and illustrious career in the U in, uh, UK and international submarine ship and uh, other maritime related projects. Uh, we look forward to his comments on uh, lessons learned in the past um, in the hope of uh, applying them to the future. John. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm always following David and um, interesting uh, whether we say similar things. We'll see. Oh, sorry. I've gone. Um, Success teaches us nothing, only failure teaches. And you have to learn from the mistakes of others because you won't live long enough to make them all yourself. True? Well, at least it is according to Admiral Rickover. And as one who worked within his philosophical approach to submarine acquisition and support, these are probably good starting points. There are, however, only reviews of failures rather than for achievements. We always seem to know need a scapegoat rather than to seek out a champion. Lessons Learned was the title I was asked to address at this conference. And having spent many years in the acquisition and support of submarines, I would perhaps rather have the question posed differently. A guide to the delivery of a successful program, perhaps. And I've taken the liberty of using this as my theme. And it is, though, a personal view, and is not based, as was the sustainment review, on compelling evidence, as Warren King wished for. So it's not compelling evidence. So what are my sources of information? Experience, sure, both nationally and internationally, and there really is no substitute. And for the avoidance of any doubt, not all of my experiences were good. The very nature of submarine design is that it is heuristic. Only by intimately being part of it and at a real level at some time do you really begin to understand that it is a massive challenge to achieving the necessary compromises through rigorous analysis, synthesis, and persuasion, often in politically charged atmospheres or reviewing incidents, both technical and operational or progress during upkeep, update, and upgrade. There is very little in the public domain on which to draw out lessons learned, although there are lots of opinions amongst the many stakeholders. Public project reviews are generally conducted, as David mentioned, by government auditors, such as national audit offices, and these have limitations. They're usually led by accountants and primarily focus on cost and time. And they cannot comment on performance shortfalls, in submarines that is. And they avoid any personal accountability and need to be agreed by the sponsor, the relevant defense ministry. So it is sometimes easier to agree to a lesser crime than the underlying cause. It may be too difficult to apportion responsibility, too embarrassing or too classified to air in public. They're also undertaken with 2020 hindsight and understandably cannot retrospectively undertake the analysis in the time frame and context nor the pressure when original decisions were made, particularly if key assumptions at such times were deemed reasonable in the prevailing circumstances. And having appeared as a witness before parliamentary committees, as many people here I'm sure have done, to explain some problem or financial difficulty or other, is often seen more like a blood sport than an opportunity to comprehend the challenges. <laughs> Despite this, audit reports do contain and often repeatable lessons to be learned. The Rand Corpora Corporation undertook lessons learned study into, published in 2012 for the UK's Astute Class Submarine Acquisition Program and drew up a comprehensive list of lessons learned. It's well worth a read. And I would draw on some of their lessons, but Rand did not have any formal access to defense relevant papers, nor able to cross-examine key players, and could not be as forensic analysis as I suspect they would have wished. 
then by observing others and how they achieve excellence and the continuity of excellence, particularly in the UK, the US and France, and more recently in Australia, and the importance of following rigorous processes and logical decision making in the management of engineering and supply chain, preventing requirements creep, all aligned with authority, accountability and responsibility, and delegation to the lowest possible level. Acknowledge the errors of myself and others, particularly those around me. It's always unwise to focus on the negative. One can learn from the positive too. And success in programs should be simple to measure. Only three things are required. Meet the required performance, at the great cost, at the great timescale. What is more difficult, I think, is to be confident any lessons I've learned over the years are relevant to Australia and Australian institutions. There are two activities I would believe are important to cover as part of lessons learned. This is what to buy and how to buy, the two critical but interdependent functions. All navies are very capital intensive and Puget submarines are the most expensive asset to acquire and own, other than large aircraft carriers which have the same characteristics. My focus, I think, will be centered on how to buy. That's my skill set, as it were. But first, a few remarks on what to buy. What to buy is the territory of capability managers or requirement setters. You also allocate the budget, and they may specify some givens. That is their prerogative, but in practice, all requirements must be tradable, as we've heard, since giving capability managers a free hand is almost as bad as telling them what they can have, a practice I'm much more familiar with in the UK. They have a difficult intellectual assignment. They require a battle-winning solution that is affordable. And to be mindful of the duration of such projects is measured in decades with future technological improvements almost impossible to predict. The product must also be future-proof, as David mentioned, and they clearly have to work, we've heard, with the operational analysis folk. For example, I joined the UK's Trafalgar project in 1976, it's true, almost at its conception. The last of the class will be decommissioned post-2020, nearly 45 years later. And that is not an unusual time frame for a modern, complex submarine life cycle. The revolution in information technology, communications, weapon performance has been staggering in contrast to the maritime technology that has only slowly changed. From material available in the public space, and as articulated at this conference by several speakers, the what to buy is, I suggest, already bounded in very broad capability terms and could be summarized, as we heard yesterday, as a contemporary Collins with improvements largely in the stealth space. But even within this broad definition, there may be some key givens, for example, incorporation of a certain command system or equipped with a certain weapon system. But I suspect there may be many others, but much remains to be detailed with much greater clarity. The task to buy falls to the procurement community. And, as a difficult, and this is a difficult space in which to work. Some design will always be about resolving conflicting demands, the ultimate compromise and extremely difficult to successfully deliver. And you will always upset everyone sooner or later, particularly if one concentrates on testing the robustness of advantages, since unlike disadvantages, at least in my experience, they have the annoying habit of fading with development. It also needs the support of the R&D community, the industrial base, supply chain, and an iron grip to prevent requirements creep. Vision for future upgrades, built-in margins mentions, needs to be provided and crucially protected. And there may be some, maybe some imposed, uh, generally politically derived inputs assembled in South Australia or used to American companies, or Australian companies, I should have said. And this can constrain and heavily influence design solutions and, of course, cost. And there must be creative tension between the what and how to buy communities for an acceptable solution to emerge that meets the requirement for the budget set within the constraints of the industrial landscape, yet battle winning. There's no point in delivering a solution that comes in second. There have been some suggestions, it seems, on how to buy and even what to buy for Australia. 
by purchasing MOTS off the shelf or leasing SSNs. MOTS is a very attractive operation, uh, option if the capability is a very good match for the required what. The UK strategic weapon system capability is a classic MOTS buy or purchase, but rarely articulated as such. But acceptance of MOTS solution as a means of acceptance the, means accepting the consequences, and these need to be pretty fully comprehended. The UK did follow a similar path for a contemporary Collins for its Trafalgar class submarines. These were truly modified Swiftshore class, but these two classes have concurrent design and build programs, unlike the contemporary Collins with a 20 year gap. And the Astute class did begin life as a batch two Trafalgar class, and that was while well the last T boat was under construction. The what and how permeates the whole acquisition process, and absolute clarity on respective roles and responsibilities is necessary from the outset. If the what is not controlled after the immediately after the how has been established, a project will be in serious trouble from the outset. I think David mentioned that already. There are a number of key assumptions that in my experience need to be accepted and embraced for a successful, bespoke submarine program. I've called these conditional enablers. The acquisition of bespoke sophisticated, uh, the acquisition of bespoke sophisticated class of submarines is banded by conditions that most procurement authorities are reluctant to accept and will often take an extraordinary steps, certainly this was my experience in the UK, to overcome. The conundrum is quite simple to articulate. Is it practical to undertake such procurements by competition? Is the client able to transfer all the risk, whether financial or technical, Nationally, there are no competitive markets for such procurements, less off the shelf. And the cost of failure is so great, the necessary risk premiums would most likely be prohibitive. And for a procurer, it's not a comfortable space to occupy. So, well, in the rewind recently, I asked the question, are Collins class submarines a strategic asset? Virtually all senior officials agreed that the submarine force was strategically, was a strategic capability. That perhaps should not be surprising given their sustainment cost, 40% of the annual naval sustainment budget, but only 6% of its manpower. And David talked about this in some detail, so we'll just add a bit to it. It follows, I suggest, that the class, the new class that is, should be managed strategically. And from my experience, a program that is strategic is most likely to maintain program, performance and budget. Such programs have, I think, key features, and David talked about some, I'll add a few more. Clarity of the requirement. A fully um, integrated acquisition program. Robust governance. Locks in the political leadership. Forces strong program and project management. Ensures the best resources are, whether financial, personal, and industrial are made available. Has clarity of delivery and holds those responsible to account. In short, interesting words we've chosen the same here, a national enterprise. And it would certainly have some unique features. In particular, those with no votes but limited responsibility must not derail the approval of funding necessary to ensure program momentum. If you maintain program momentum, you're most likely to have a time-constrained program, David mentioned that, and that is most likely to be delivered on time at the cost you set because you've limited the time to when you can spend money. The UK's deterrent programs, both Polaris and Trident, were managed as strategic projects and were successful in cost, time and performance. They did have specific arrangements for financial approvals, but they did not operate outside what I call robust rules of accountability for public expenditure. A key lesson perhaps then is to formally make this a strategic program. Acquisition of submarines is extremely challenging with many interrelated and complex systems all operating for months in hostile environment and in self-contained and self-contained material support. There are no prototypes or technology demonstrators. They're almost, as they say, handmade and almost impossible to re-engineer once built without excessive cost. The Australian program is at the more extreme end of technical difficulty. 
conventionally powered submarine, but with capability close to that of a nuclear submarine. Distant and long patrols, extended underwater endurance, unsupported, complex and integrated wet sensors, sophisticated payloads and systems, and a heavy emphasis on stealth. The future program is proceeding on the twin track approach we've heard. Option three, a sort of adopted Collins, adapted Collins rather, and option four, a complete new design, although we've heard some things about that yesterday which maybe modify that. The lessons learned that can be applied to both these options are similar, but they have some significant differences. One seemingly evolutionary, the other potentially revolutionary, and each would appear to have off quite different risk profiles. However, in my experience, wherever one is selected, it will always be high risk. And this is true for any major submarine acquisition with a desire to be battle winning. The UK made a misjudgment when it considered the Batch 2 Fog class, later the Astute class, was low risk. Seems astonishing in hindsight. It, was a, it led to the decision to go for a competitive prime contract as its first program decision. Arrived at a suggest from the prevailing belief that prime contracting was the way to go. Was this the point at which so-called conspiracy, conspiracy voltism became endemic? I think the key lesson is, needs to accept from day one, that these such programs are all high risk. It is almost inescapable that submarine built in Australia will be procured from a single source, with large elements of the program being non-competitive. I think that might be true for a the first few. They might make some change later on. This is an anathema to all procurement agencies, as competition is the engine of innovation and the most effective lever for price control. Unfortunately, for a small fleet of submarines to be built in country, any other option would be wholly uneconomic. I think the policy would need to be embraced and accepted at the outset, otherwise it might lead to dysfunctional behaviour. And some other means of price acceptability and innovation needs to be considered. It must be self-evident from my preceding remarks that the governments cannot avoid holding the majority of the risk for such programs in the long run. Indeed, I doubt if any company would be able to hold the risks of such risks on, the, on its balance sheet and have an affordable program. Attempting to push all the risk onto industry will almost certainly lead to taking design options that are easier to build, producing capability, creates a defensive mindset by the industry, and establishes a legal jungle potentially risking default. It seems likely that a program would be conducted in an adverse environment and not a recipe for success. I suggest government can't, cannot avoid holding the majority of the risk. Never forget the cost of ownership. And it must be taken from the outset and not an afterthought. I'm sure we all know that. A submarine fleet will cost between three and five times as much as it did to procure. Some of you would have seen this in the review um, of the Collins class. I haven't been able to produce pretty pictures of submarines, but it's very close. Following the introduction to service of the Collins class, it did suffer from inadequate support arrangements. I extensively reviewed this in my uh, recent work. But fundamental is establishing the readiness requirement for the submarine force. These tables display, in a non-classified readiness terms, the requirement for two classes, the Collins class today and the UK SSBNs. For Collins, two submarines required to be consistently deployable, and this can be achieved with a fleet of six submarines, with usually four and sometimes three available for programming, two in longer term maintenance or upgrade. This is not the same as two deployable at all times. Two submarines deployed at all times would, for example, certainly require seven or maybe even eight submarines, probably two crews for each submarine, and a much greater investment in base support, a very much greater sustainment cost. A table for the UK's Trident fleet, one deployed at all times, or continuous sea deterrent, and this requires a fleet of four submarines, we heard yesterday from France, with one in longer term maintenance. The latter have requires two crews for each submarine, a significant cost driver, and extensive infrastructure. Readiness is the key driver to sustainment costs. The readiness profile would dictate the number of 
submarine crews, press submarine, the industrial support arrangements, training, shore-based infrastructure, the annual budget, and a host of other features. The cost of sustaining submarine force, we at least have said, three or four times the cost in initial acquisition. And submarines engaged on long existing patrols need to be reliable. And ensuring this is a key in the activity in the acquisition phase. And for UK programs, it's been the practice to ruthlessly and rigorously test all new equipments to product testing. Such equipment is refurbished either as a class spare or installation into a later submarine. Such programs will require the engineering design subsequent through life phases of a competent cadre of scientific and professional staff and a much larger group for the detailed engineering, manufacturing, commissioning and phasing. Given that the government will realistically hold the risk, the in-house organisation must be unconsciously competent and if necessary, it may need to be create, to create this and plan for its continuity. In my experience, we'll have to sync posts a so-called program manager, keeping the show on the road and managing the generally large stakeholder base, and that's a full-time job, while the project or design manager can get on the task of developing the technical solution with the industrial base. Major task is shown here. If such an organization does not exist, it will need to be created, and that is and will be a precursor for any other activity, and this will be need seed funding at the outset. A competent in-house team is a necessary condition to meet. And I think uh, Simon Todd is on the case, as we showed yesterday, and the two roles seem well articulated, so I feel quite encouraged about that. Likewise, they'll need to a competent industrial industry to undertake much of the detailed design tasks, procurement, manufacture, install, and test, and complete commission. The majority, over 85% of the expenditure, we most likely consumed in this phase. And the organisation must be competent to undertake that task. Again, if such an organisation does not exist, it will need to be established by the industrial companies. And that is and would be a major task and exceptionally challenging commercially. There are numerous models to be developed, but capability is fundamental skill set. And the in-house team will need to be unconsciously competent to actually set this up with industry. And again, we've talked, we've talked today, David, that is the process that started, and again, that is uh, really consistent with what I've actually said here. So summarizing, clarity on the what and how to buy is fundamental. The government, please make it strategic. Acknowledge the program will always be high risk and manage it accordingly. Acknowledge you cannot avoid holding at least a greater percentage of the risk for some time. Accept that sole source will have to be in place for some of it. Acknowledge the cost of ownership. You require a competent buyer and you require a competent supplier. And these ingredients are necessary, in my experience, for a sporting chance of delivering a successful program. These were the same conditions that applied to the UK from about 1960 to 1990 when it produced some very successful SSNs and SSBN programs. As far as I can judge now, in place for its successor program and the last four astute SSN class. In short, if it works, don't break it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, John. Um, our uh, third speaker is uh, Ms. Janice Cocking from DSTO. Uh, as Chief of the Maritime Division, she and her organization will have a significant impact on the future submarine, uh, especially in the areas of performance, survivability, and safety. Uh, she stands at the interface responsible for the transition of technology from the laboratory to systems industry can deliver to the future submarine. Managing the risk associated with this work is of the utmost importance to her success. Um, we had one perspective on systems engineering from uh, Dr. Winter in the last session. Uh, we look forward now to um, Janice's remarks on this, uh, this topic now. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks very much for having the opportunity to speak today. Um, and I will be t talking from a framework of a scientist. So what does science bring to this? And it dovetails very neatly into what Don Winter was saying before the break. Uh, the scientists bring to this uh, a demand to be able to provide objective quality evidence on which the government can base decisions. The scientists really need to also provide an assessment of technical risks 
and perhaps an assessment of how we go about mitigating those risks. And in some instances, the scientists will come along with technology solutions, and I'd like to touch on each of those today in my presentation. I'd also like to talk about, um, in systems integration, really again to, to echo uh, what uh, Secretary Winter was talking about, learning from the past. I have a slightly different view on who wears risk from, from the conversations that have been held in most, most instances. I actually don't think the government wears the risk. The government risks embarrassment if things go wrong. And so there might be a political risk, but that's not the real risk. This is who wears the risk. The risk of the submariners who we send into harm's way. And so all the work that we do in science and technology area is really looking down to, to reduce the risks of sending these people into harm's way because we either haven't got the systems integration right or we haven't got the subsystems that feed into those uh, overall systems correct. So what, so what do we learn from, from history? And I'd like to start off with talking about some successes. And the first one's associated with the surface fleet, which some people might call the targets. However, for the ANSAC anti-ship missile defence system, the upgrade program there, I think, is a, is a big success. And it was associated with some really high-risk areas in technology. And the technical risks were, were identified fairly early on, several years ago, uh, at, at the second pass, so through the CNED process. So the CNED process is, has really paid off uh, in this particular instance. And these were the areas that you can see on, on this uh, chart here that were identified as areas where, where risk mitigation was needed to be uh, undertaken. I'd only like to talk about one of these uh, in view of the time because I'd like to move on to submarine examples. But, but the example I talk about is combat system integration, mostly because it's bringing together all these other elements and if the combat in the integration into the combat system really meant that people would not be able to fight and win. So the government approved the risk mitigation strategy and it was, it was underpinned by a use of a simulation-based approach but simulation that was again validated on the way through. So modelling and simulation was used in the, the needs and requirements phases uh, in looking at uh, supporting the, the studies to define the capability requirements. It enabled us to undertake the comparison of the various options leading to the final decisions and it, it helped our specification of the function and performance requirements. During the acquisition phase, we were able to use it to characterise the combat system performance and, and re reassess it uh, through a, a design iteration limp and to, uh, again, to be able to support the test and evaluation planning. So the, this, this, um, these phases, I think, were really keys to be able to, to uh, achieve the success that's uh, been, been realised. So what does it look like? Um, the, in the Combat Systems Integration Laboratory. Uh, this, is, this is the laboratory in Adelaide uh, with the operators in place. And so the operators and having operators in the loop is a key to the success in my view of this sort of simulation and this sort of integration laboratory. So we use the operators for uh, the operations room redesign really being t able to take into, a pla into account their input and, and, and combining that with input that we get gained from sea rides and collecting the data, having mock-up solutions in the laboratory so we could re uh, move things around and then undertake the, uh, the CAD design with uh, D DNPS uh, undertook that in DMO to under, uh, have a look at the real evaluations. The operator engagement studies were a key to this, looking at the operator workload, being able to bring together how the generic combat system and the human machine interface might work effectively together, and then to work with the vendors to look at uh, how we realise the best result uh, for the operators. 
and then being able to take it to sea in, in various exercises, at, at, at virtual exercises, and become more and more sophisticated as time went on. So is this then wasted afterwards? So it, it isn't. Uh, we, we use it for integration of hardware in the loop, uh, being able to use it as a test bed for the radar system uh, and for the illumination system. And we'll, the intention is that we will use this as a through life facility for experimentation into the future and looking at evolution and improving the operational effectiveness of what we have. And so there are continued uses for these sorts of uh, laboratories. One of the things that's underpinning all of this though is the impact on margins for the upgrade. And so something that doesn't necessarily get spoken about much then is, is how we can actually introduce these sorts of changes in a ship that in, uh, make sure that the damage stability remains intact and that the fatigue and the design margins can still be retained. And uh, that's again been touched on by earlier speakers today. I think it's really important as part of the uh, lessons learned to understand those flow on effects and build the margins in very early in, in a design in order to be able to be in a position to provide uh, the, the inputs and the enhancements over time. We had to increase the uh, dis displacement of this ship by 300 tonnes. We needed to know we could do that safely and effectively and not have these flow on impacts over life. So there, there's a the success. I think we actually are getting better at it. Um, but let's move to submarines. For Collins class submarine, uh, if I reflect on the past and reflect on the science and technology program, I think it's quite true to, t to say that back when we were looking at the Collins class submarines, or what was then the new generation submarine, there was no coordinated s and program in Australia. It was, was piecemeal, a piecemeal approach, our best efforts. And so we, we had some successes, but it was not coordinated. And so I think that that's something, again, where we've learned from the past. Within DSTO, there was nothing that was equivalent of a maritime division. There was no ship structures division. There were lots of divisions that were based on uh, science disciplines. There was even a physics division back then. I am not a physicist. I'm a metallurgist. Uh, so, so my first example of a success is a, is a metallurgical example. Uh, the slides that you see here are slides that, that show um, the explosion bulge test of one of the original proposals for the steel that was selected for the Collins class submarine. And, uh, and so they were really big field experiments. We won't look at the WHS impacts of that today. We've got better with the WHS, but we never <laughs> lost a person, lost a few hats <laughs> along the way. Um, but uh, this, these, these are tests where you would actually take plates of submarine steel, weld it up, cool it down uh, to minus 40, so you're in the, looking at the transition zone between ductile failure and brittle failure, uh, and, and placing a blast on it. So if this is, again, something that you don't find with commercial vessels. We're sending submarines into harm's way, potentially. So how do we make sure that the people inside the boat are safe and will survive these sorts of blasts? And in the bottom right there are the reassembled pieces, as best we could find them, of the plates from that first sort of steel that we were looking at. Uh, the replacement steel was a combination of a collaboration that was really effective between DSTO, uh, our American counterparts, and industry. So we're working very closely with BHB Spiel um, and, and, and the broad industry players to come up with a new selection of steel. And the slide there again on the right shows a blast that's been uh, effective. The bulge is there, the plate is intact through the, the weld specification. And the weld specifications that were developed, the steel that was developed was, was excellent, a big success story. The transition of that to industry is a very big success story. The rework of the welding for the Collins class submarine was world's best practice at the time, uh, a success. 
Another success I'd like to talk about is anechoic tiles. Anechoic tiles uh, for, the, for the Collins class submarine are indigenous design. Uh, and they're indigenous design for, for a very good reason. And the very good reason is that our closest partners would not let us into the laboratories to talk to them about what are their crown jewels. And rightly so, because we don't talk about now our crown jewels, and we have them. And so the anechoic tiles on the Collins class submarine are a completely indigenous design. We did all the modelling and simulation uh, back then. We did the tile design and we undertook a really big research program on looking at the acoustic performance and through life durability of these tiles. So that involved all of those areas that you see uh, uh, on the screen, looking at the, the, the materials, looking at the seawater temperatures in which they would operate, looking at the geometry of the, the tiles, looking at the operating depths because of the compressibility of the material uh, over the depths, looking at the impact of the weight of the tile on the buoyancy of the submarine, and that had, did have a, an impact uh, on the design of the submarine. The submarine was actually uh, slightly increased uh, in displacement in order to be able to achieve the, the buoyancy requirements. And you can see from the photograph on the above right there, uh, before we, as some of the tiles were being applied, the tiles don't sit across the, the whole of the surface of the, of the boat, so the distribution is uneven, and the tile's thickness is not necessarily even. So we had a, an, optimi an optimisation process based on the restrictions in weight. That was the driver for us. And so we took this from a technical readiness level of one at best um, to a successful result over a 12 year period. And that goes back to what's been also said just before about the impact and the lead time you need to have effective science to be able to deliver that into a fielded system. But you can do it. Um, and I think that we, we actually missed the installation on the first boat, but we got there for the second boat. So we turned that into an advantage as well because you could actually meet, measure the target strength signature of a, a bare boat a, and a clad boat, and we know what it is and we don't talk about it, um, but, but we know what we've got and we're very proud of what we've got. The tile adhesion technology, I would also say, is world's best practice. Our, we've never lost a, a toll from a, from a submarine, unlike any other operating navy that's got anechoic tiles. I, 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 I like to talk about this. <laughs> because I think it's something of which we should be uh, duly proud. And it's, again, it's science working in, in close cooperation um, with, with industry to realise a, a fielded system. In these cases, the, the industries include Mackay and ASC, both for the, the transition from a laboratory, uh, from those initial prototype tiles, uh, to be able to make them to the tolerances that we required that industry to make them to, uh, in order to then apply them successfully for many years now um, to the boats. So we've taken that experience and then built on it We've built on it for radar absorbing materials for masts and periscopes. And we again have indigenous design for masts and periscopes. We can manufacture um, and, uh, and design uh, these materials, both for application in submarines and surface ships, uh, to Navy specifications and change them according to the uh, evolution of threat over time. And we control it. And We've, we've started a program now, so it won't take us 12 years, on a next generation of anechoic tiles. These tiles will be much more sophisticated than what we had before. The threat has evolved, but so is how it, technology and our ability to both design and create and realise the system and apply it to a boat. And so that's somewhere where we have us as being the government furnished equipment suppliers in this particular instance. Another success for the Collins class as a big industry success was the ship control and management system. Supply by wire system used on the Collins. Again, the risks were identified early 
and uh, the, the plan was developed and again land-based facilities for looking at prototypes and providing the ongoing support and, and it's all based in industry. And so even though as time's moved on we're getting to the stage with that particular system we've got some hardware obsolescence, the underpinning lessons there are, are very uh, successful I think. So let's move to the other side. These are some of the, the, um, the headlines that came around and, and issues I think that uh, we need to address because I think as John rightly said, you learn so much more from failure than success. And so I think that uh, from a systems integration perspective, let's start at the top. <coughs> Noisy as a rock band. And, uh, and how DSTO is positioning itself to uh, address some of these issues. This time around, we actually have a coordinated science and technology program. And this science and technology program is again designed to assist in the development of the requirements, but really to understand and mitigate the, uh, the integration risks as, as a key element to that. And as I've said before, we need to be able to provide the objective quality uh, technical advice to governments so that they can make, reach their decisions based on sound advice uh, rather than lots of um, opinions, informed though those opinions might be. Given the lead times and the consequences of some of the decisions that were made on the submarines, the key areas for, for our uh, science and technology activities in the near term are those that you see there. Propulsion and energy storage because that will underpin the range, uh, the endurance and to some extent the stealth of the boats. Stealth is a, is a key for us. Stealth uh, again for us is, is one of those sovereign capabilities where we, we think that we have a really good program in place and it has been assessed uh, by the, we've invited the technical director of the Naval Undersea Warfare Centre uh, to come and have a look at uh, our program and to provide some assessments uh, from his perspective on where we're going and we've also had PEO subs from uh, the USA to come and also have a look at our programs in order to provide us with a ten technical benchmarking on whether we're going down the right road or not. Uh, because one of the problems with dealing with a cloistered environment is that you can pat yourself on the back um, and get it completely wrong. Combat system is a key. If the combat system is not, uh, is not integrated from the start, uh, again, the decisions that you make and the replacement of the Collins combat system, I think is a really good lessons learned. There was a really high risk a uh, high payoff program, but the risk wasn't realised and so we didn't have a backup option. So, so I think again, this time I think we're getting much cleverer on looking at uh, on the choices of combat systems, the implications of combat systems, the centrality of the combat system and being able to understand uh, what that, the implications for that for the design of the boat. Hydrodynamics and, and propeller and propulsion technology are all, in, all part of the design loop. And uh, again, lessons learned from before. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And if I bring it back to people, because they're the key, I think that uh, I'll give you some examples of that. We've been running ahead with our enabling research programs, ahead of the C1000 program, and some of those enabling programs are now uh, folding in to the C1000 programs. I'd just like to talk a little bit about those. So again, we'll, we'll talk about hydroacoustics as best we can. And I think that uh, talking about Moore's law uh, is, is a, one of the interesting implications uh, associated with hydroacoustics and noise. And if you look at that chart on the, on the top left, it's really talking about the ability of uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, to have an impact on design. In this case it's aircraft but uh, that's as good an example as any. And so where we sat on the curve back around the time that the Collins contract was signed. Uh, and this is Moore's law in action. 
About 13 years later, um, we had uh, this, is, this is where we were uh, in the Get Well program for Collins on trying to address the noisy as a rock band issue and the is areas associated with hydroacoustics. So we put a mock up of the Collins design into our wind tunnels. You can see the sticky tape there in those photographs. We've got a bit more sophisticated since then, but that, that worked at the time. We used woolies. Um, to have a look at uh, separation of flow. And we used the, the best combination of computational fluid dynamics we had at the time, again, to, to validate the models to come up with a solution. Could we have made this solution better? Yes, we could. But then it's a, a cost capability trade-off for the design. So the, the, the solution that's been put into service and used on the Collins today is, is almost like an 80% solution. Because to introduce the 100% solution meant we would have had to have gone through and uh, reworked the, the totality of um, the weapons delivery system. And that was a decision that was made that we, would, we wouldn't take that route of, of that cost. And so we have the solution that we have today. So how did we get into this situation in the first place? I think one of the reasons we got into this situation in the first place is that, once again, we weren't a clever enough buyer. Being an informed buyer is a key. And, and I think it was also because of the culture of the designer who wanted to help. So fairly late in the piece, there was a decision made that it would be really lovely if we had a cylindrical array that could look 270 degrees. So put this... Now, the, the, the original sketches that you saw of the Collins did not have the bulbous nose, had a, had a different shape altogether. And we introduced this array at the front and the result was the, the bulbous nose with a knuckle that created a whole lot of problems uh, flowing into, into a propeller. Uh, and so we accepted that. Uh, we, that's, that's, that was what was wanted. The design had not been locked down. So you have this sort of capability creep. So here's that we've got to lock down the design at some stage and say, this is where we are, this is what we're going forward with. Uh, and, and, and stop and, and uh, say, maybe another batch we will do that. But for now, this is what we're doing. The other thing that I think that we need to, to think about there in uh, getting lessons learned from the past is that the propeller and the contract for the propeller was designed for a design point. That led to lots of arguments. So again, I think that we were not an informed customer. We did not design a really good contract. We got what we asked for, but it was not what we needed. Uh, and again, for propeller design, you want it to perform over a range, not a point. So you could have these endless arguments where everyone was right, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, and I think we've, we've gone beyond that now. So back in 2000, we did not have a hydrodynamics program in DSTO, so we established one. And in the, in the years since then, we've, we, we are getting a lot better. So where are we today? In the 13 years, if you look from the 13 years from the Collins contract to, to, to the Get Well program to where we are today. Today, we're a lot more sophisticated, uh, partly because of Moore's law. We're at a stage where we can actually look at the, the, the flow over whole submarines. We can actually look at uh, the different, different techniques for looking at simulation of flow. Um, one of the challenges, of course, with computational fluid dynamics is that it produces beautiful pictures like these ones. But do they actually mean anything? Can you validate it? So you've got to have various ways of validating, and one of our uh, key areas in enabling us to do that is the cavitation tunnel down at the Maritime College in the University of Tasmania. Uh, they're a key to this academia, so it doesn't all sit in DSTO, it has to sit in a range of areas. So we can use the cavitation tunnel and be able to look at the flow there to be able to have this cross-validation so that we know that we have an ability. If the government decides that it will choose an off-the-shelf design, we can tell the government that if that's their choice, this is the consequences on hydroacoustics of that choice. If the government decides that to, to go down a route where we'll go for a new design, 
we can inform the designers of the where we are with design tools, but again, provide um, advice and on what we what the results will be uh, for that particular design on far field signatures. Uh, that's what we're moving to towards, and that's what we're starting to realise. Of course, this this is not without its problems as well. Uh, this, these are scale models. These are, these are not these are not full scale submarines, but going through and learning the lessons uh, and to have that faith in the fidelity of the modelling, I think will help the design project and the process overall and the result that we will get this time round. So let's talk about the other problem, availability. And John's touched on that, but I'd like to talk about um, uh, some of the, the issues associated with power and energy systems. A lot of the issues associated with the failure and the, the availability of the Collins was associated with the diesel engines, um, Hedemora diesel engines in particular. So no one identified Hedemora as a problem. If I'd been doing a technical risk assessment back then, with the knowledge that I had back then, I wouldn't have identified it as a problem. In a land-based system, uh, in railway, railway applications, um, in, in the applications for which they were used, that subsystem, that system worked really well. But there was no systems integration program, no land-based facility on looking at that in submarine operations, where you've got variable back pressure, uh, where you've got different couplings, the impact of removing a flywheel. Uh, so how do we get, you know, what, what do we learn from that? What do we need to do? And this is where, again, the systems uh, engineering approach uh, comes into play. And so we have a program in place now uh, that's going through, going through the, the committee process on looking at uh, the development of the submarine propulsion and energy support integration facility. So the idea with this, and it's a very busy chart, and I do not expect you to read all the various parts of it, but there are, there are, there are feedback loops so that we take all the systems and the subsystems and components that feed into the delivery of the power and energy system, which by themselves might be terrific, uh, to be able to qualify that as a, as a total system and to be able to undertake uh, progressively the operational test and evaluation of that system and to be able to feed into that the R&D and then beyond that uh, into uh, the, the development of the, the improvements of the, uh, the R&D to uh, acceptance of the systems and the subsystems and to then be able to use that in, in true pre-build and assembly and a test before it goes into the assembly facilities. Again, similarly with the, uh, the Combat System Integration Laboratory, I see these sorts of uh, integration facilities being able to use uh, for in-service support through life. You can run ahead uh, with the programs, try and run the systems at their limits so you know the design limits, the operating limits uh, of, the, uh, of the propulsion system and its integration in the main. If I talk about the R&D program here, We've got R&D programs on looking at smart government design to be able to be able to respond really effectively with variable back pressures, to look at alternative um, uh, energy storage systems, things other than lead-acid batteries, and looking at the, the technical risks associated with that, the inter integration of that, the implications for that, for the whole of the power and energy train, because that's a, it's an expensive decision it's a decision which will have impact on the design and the margins of the boat. We need to have that right, right from the start. So as part of our modelling framework for all of this, uh, again, we're looking at uh, integrated performance models, looking at the, uh, the major characteristics of the, the platform and feeding that eventually into the detailed platform models that will be used by the designer. But I'd like now to move on to uh, the combat system and the human element, because as I keep uh, rattling on and emphasising that it's the, the human element that will provide the, the value and the, and the capability edge in, in, the, in the end. So 
just to, to move through and just to talk about the human systems integration and, and where we are um, with, with uh, what we're doing in looking at the next generation of, uh, of human systems and, and integration, I think that uh, we'll move away from the platform aspects now. So what we're talking about here is the science underpinning the design of control rooms, looking at co use of cognitive en engineering, looking at command team interactions and being able to build on what we've learned from Collins uh, with human in the loop simulations. And you can make use of the flash 3D de design tools to make it all look really schmick for when you take it to government. Um, one of the, one, one of the uh, little things that, that, that might get you on some of this though uh, are things that people don't necessarily think about. Um, and one of them is, is anthropometrics and that's almost impossible to see, but it's, it's a graph that shows the, uh, the measurement of, of height of Australian Army personnel over a 50-year period. So why is this important? Over the, over the uh, arrow there that's 30 years, over the last 30 years, the average, the average height uh, of Army personnel has grown by five centimetres. What's the impact of that over the life of the boat and the design of a boat? Uh, so you think, what, what, what might this do to the margins? So if you've got everyone who's my size and you design bunks for my size, um, that's one thing. But if I'm designing it for many other people in this room, let alone the, the, the young men and women who are going to go to sea later on, they don't want to be in a bunk that fits my length. Because here we are, if I send them to sea in a bunk that's my length and they're at sea for a couple of weeks and then I'm going to expect them to fight and win, I'm setting them up to be suboptimal right from the start. So all of those small issues need to be built into, into the considerations. So we look at that. We look at uh, having rigorous methods for looking at the, the design of the control room spaces that the interfaces and evaluating it and going back through these, through these limps, loops and making sure that, uh, that the submariners are involved right from the start so that they have their say on what support uh, decision aids they might wish to see, uh, what, what the feedback is on whether they as subject matter experts want more fully interactive screens or not. Uh, and we need to feed that back in then too. What are the margins and, and requirements that we might need and allowances for power and energy? Because all of these sorts of systems require power and energy. And we don't have the luxury that you have in uh, nuclear boats of having an endless energy source. We have to work to that energy budget. So the sorts of things that we're looking at uh, again, on looking at human-machine inter interface, you have what they say and then you have what they do. So s techniques such as using eye tracking on looking at where people look on screens, uh, being able to use that to understand the workload that we're placing on them uh, is, is part of our program at the moment. And a part of a program that's a whole lot easier to talk about than talking about stealth. And, and fatigue is also an element for this. And this is, a, again, charts showing uh, blink rates, which we can relate back to, uh, to uh, the demands on cognition and fatigue, because it, <coughs> I know many people in the audience have been in submarines. I've been submarining myself. Uh, you sit there and for vast periods of time, uh, not a lot happens, but then you've got a spring too. So you've got to get to that stage where you can be able to uh, make sure that you don't fall into the trap of having that lack of attention uh, in order to be able to respond in very, in, in very short time when the need arises. So we're using all of that to feed into our, our investigations of the metrics that can be used to assist designs. Uh, and uh, again, uh, using the virtual simulation tools so in summary, so what, what are some of the lessons that I think we, we, we need to, to take away? I think the integration risks can be successfully managed so long as you actually understand uh, what it is that you're trying to achieve 
So you need to have those specifications and measures of performance and measures of, uh, uh, of, of uh, assessment and effectiveness. You need to have uh, systems integration so that you can go back and do the analysis, do the design, do the evaluation early on before you lock down the design. I think everyone needs to recognise and actually talk about it's the submariners who wear the risk. Uh, it's do I want do I want my nieces and nephews, or uh, you know, or, or other people's children to to go to sea in something that might be cheap, but it's going to send them to the die. And so I think that's something that we need to think about. And I think that as part of that, we need to have the operator involved in the design uh, very early in all these loops and very frequently in the loops and embrace what their experiences are and try and fold that as best we can uh, into the design wherever possible. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Janice, for those comments. Um, the topic of this session has been um, program or project management. And um, in order to help encourage some uh, questions here, which we'll have time for in a, in a second, um, I had a couple comments that I, I wanted to make before we open up the floor. Um, going into the future, there'll be a, a great deal of pressure, I think, to uh, get on with construction as time progresses. Um, the valley of death issues, uh, submarine gap issues, and so on. Um, so I think it's up to the project management organization and the program manager in particular, you know, to do the right thing in order to avoid, as uh, Dr. Winter mentioned uh, earlier, um, to avoid doing it again later uh, with uh, the inevitable schedule delays and rework and budget breaches that that uh, will entail. Um, so what are the things that the project management team uh, or organization needs to pay attention to along the way? I think um, that uh, th these are things that are uh, important to think about now, even though the start of construction is still years away. Uh, establishing firm requirements is the most, one of the most important things, and then once they are established, uh, having the discipline uh, to uh, not change them at, at, uh, in, a, in any kind of an arbitrary or capricious way, only making changes that are absolutely necessary. Um, uh, again, as David mentioned earlier, um, uh, or indicated, making sure that the engineering and the design is essentially complete before you start construction, at least at the, uh, uh, the um, general arrangement level and, and beyond that into, the, into most of the detailed design level. Um, making sure that planning and work packages are completed in, in well in, in advance of need, making sure that parts are on hand well in, in advance of need. Um, these are all things that people have, in the last day or so, as we've been going through this conference and today, and uh, have uh, talked about. Um, making sure that risk reduction activities are, are complete, um, and whenever possible, lean toward doing things in an evolutionary way as opposed to uh, looking for revolutionary uh, solutions to problems. Um, having uh, one uh, integrated schedule and adequate uh, budget in place uh, is obviously imp important. Uh, having a, a method for collecting and applying lessons learned along the way, and then rigorous ad ad adherence to, um, to program com uh, commitments along the way. And then uh, last but not least, as we've also talked about, having a, a, a trained workforce, both uh, engineering, design, and, and co uh, construction trades. So hopefully some of those comments will help inspire maybe some uh, questions or give you something to think about. And uh, we will, uh, with that, uh, open the floor up to questions and comments. Muir. Uh, John, thank you. Uh, Mira, Mira MacDonald um, from BMT Defence Services in the UK. Um, maybe I can I can pick up on on the, on, the, on the theme and not so much a question, but, but but an observation that the panel might like to react to in terms of the the, the strong theme of l learning from our mistakes that, that both John and Janice uh, uh, brought out, and, and and I think Don Don Winter. In, in the previous segment, uh, very strongly brought out from the U.S. experience, uh, and maybe I'm speaking 
from my own experience, uh, not from BMT, but, but when I was in government service in the UK, uh, and thinking back to the uh, astute program that, that many commentators have mentioned. Um, so that was a, a four-year journey for me as the IPT leader, but the first four days, uh, uh, my team told me, don't worry, Muir, uh, we've transferred all risk to industry, this is going to be straightforward. Um, uh, oh, don't worry, Muir, we've, uh, uh, we've, we've, we've got a maximum price contract, um, uh, so uh, you know, there's only so much we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pay in this, the, 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 the contractor carries all the risk. Uh, don't worry, uh, the prime contractor, the, the, the systems integrator, he's even going to be buying the reactor plant as MOTs off the shelf from, from Rolls-Royce. And I'm going, oh really? Uh, oh really? Oh, and the best bit is, you know, we've, we've, there's no danger of us taking the risk back, uh, us getting, uh, in, interfering in the design or the activity, because we've taken all the overseers out of the shipyard, all 50 of them that we used to have there. Uh, we've taken all them out as well, so, so it's all going to be marvellous. Well, of course, uh, the, the, the next four years was undoing all of that well-intentioned idea of, 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 of such a simple uh, procurement strategy. Uh, and I think uh, Don Winter uh, was saying the same. They're still relearning uh, from, uh, from a literal combat ship. Uh, my colleagues back in the Institute program, it's still an acquisition program, are still relearning uh, those lessons. My observation is that uh, with the Collins acquisition, there were a lot of the similar sort of mistakes made. But I'm just observing that, that for future submarine, um, Australia is able to start with a cleaner sheet than maybe the US has on LCS, or maybe the UK still has on Astute. The lessons have been learned, uh, can learn from US, can learn from UK, can learn from Collins. So it's a cleaner sheet. Uh, there really is a very, very strong foundation for very strong project management, contract strategy development, uh, and, and arguably stronger than, than the situation the UK and the US find themselves in. Is there a question what's buried the in there somewhere? What, what's no. the question? Would you agree that Australia has a stronger oh, okay. foundation? Okay. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, is this thing working? It, it's very difficult to know, isn't it? I mean, to be you know, where they are at the moment, at least having been associated over here for the last three years. Um, but they know an awful lot more than perhaps sometimes that uh, comes out in the public domain about some of the things that weren't quite as well. Janice talked about some of them. And they know an awful lot more they can feed back in than actually I think we give them people credit for. So I think they do know there are some lessons learned, and there are quite a few people around who knew some of the things that didn't go as well as they could, and they can certainly pick up from some of the ways, at least I observed, that uh, with procurement options and uh, prime contracting and transferring the risk, that simply in practice, however you might wish it, is not possible to do it. And if you accept those and then have strategies to deal with them, you're more likely to come across with a successful solution. So I think they do know a lot more than they think. And if you actually think about how the Collins system has been transformed, in a relatively short time, people do know what to do as long as they knew the direction in which they had to go. And that's been quite impressive, as I said elsewhere. So I think it's a lot stronger than you think. And some of the work that Simon and his team are doing would give me at least some quite good encouragement for a starter for 10, for this intelligent customer or conscious capability, un unconscious capability at the, um, the buyer end. I think there are some good signs. Not there yet, but they're learning pretty fast, I'd say. Is this, this one working? Yeah, I mean, Mir, it's the first time somebody suggested to me that not having a body of experience uh, mm -hmm. and uh, practice to work on is an advantage, but I, you know, I take your point, actually. Um, if, you, if you want to apply lessons and experience, um, I think you have, to, you have to start from what, what do you know, what do you have, um, and really understand what it is you don't know. But the fact that you haven't got um, a body of people who are wedded to a lot of the practice can be can make it easier to apply better models when, when you when you construct the program. So I don't think I mean, is the sheet, the sheet's definitely emptier, um, and therefore it's a bit cleaner. Um, 
I, it really is a question of doing all the things we've been talking about for the last day and a half and doing, doing them really well. So I'm, a, I'm an absolute believer in every project that I've come across that ran into trouble or went well. And when it went well, it's sometimes due to the fact you did everything right in the first place and so all the seeds of success were right there to begin with. Uh, sometimes it went well because you're lucky. Um, that, that don't, don't dismiss it, it does happen. Um, but when it goes badly, you can almost always find the reason for why it's gone badly somewhere right in the first stages of the project, almost always, uh, unless it's a technical issue that, that just came and defeated you. So, um, yeah, I, and I'm, not, I'm not sure it's an advantage, but I am sure we have the opportunity to get as many things right as you can. It won't get them all right, nobody ever does. Um, we have the opportunity to do that, yep, absolutely. Chris. I'd just like to follow up on that point and uh, refer back to comments that uh, made by John Coles, if I recorded it properly. You said, I think there was little in the public domain on the lessons learned, uh, especially in the performance side. You know, we get auditors' reports and all sorts of other things on time and uh, uh, cost, but not on performance issues. Um, Clearly, there are security and other reasons why that might be. But nevertheless, it may well leave the public with the impression that it's more about project management and less about the research and development and uh, investigative work, such as uh, Janice uh, Cocking has uh, uh, very uh, uh, richly uh, and, and very eloquently described. Um, my question, though, uh, really for Janice is, it's all very well looking at all the experience that we have gained in our own country and from our colleagues uh, around the world with whom you've had a, a, a good dialogue. But what about something like uh, air independent propulsion, which none of them have got any experience of and neither do we, and we're talking about it as being a major part of uh, propulsion and energy management for the next platform. What, what's your approach there? How do you learn other people's lessons? It's a really good question, Chris, and, and we do it in several ways. I think that there, there, there are allies who use um, air independent propulsion very effectively. Uh, and you know, there's, the, there's the, the, the German submarine experience, there's the Swedish submarine experience, the Japanese submarine experience, uh, all use air, air independent propulsion for their particular concepts of operations. Uh, they've been fielded systems now for, uh, for decades in some instances. And so we can learn from that and, and I think that the, what's really important is to, to take their experiences for their concepts of operations and then fold that into the Australian concepts of operations and operating environment to see whether the, the trade-offs uh, the benefits that you get are warranted against both the cost and the risks and what else you might have to give up in order to be able to incorporate air independent propulsion, uh, whether there might be other elements of a propulsion system that might give you benefits by investing there as an alternative. So, so though I didn't speak about it today, that's not be doesn't mean we're not doing anything. We are, sorry, I, I just, that was one I left out just in the interest of time, sorry. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Well, I have one. Um, we have talked about lessons learned quite a bit and um, my, my question is really, is there some sort of a formal lessons learned program that's going on in relation to Future Submarine that not only captures lessons learned but distributes them, um, analyzes them for applicability to Future Submarine and then um, applies them uh, to the you know, process of designing and uh, building the ship. Is that a, a formal program or is that just something that's being done in an ad hoc sort of way? Um, it, it's, it's a bit of a mixture I think. I think there's certainly um, there's certainly a very uh, formal attention paid to what can we learn from the Collins program, both good and bad, by the way. 
um, and some of the things we've described with Janice about involving the STO right from the start mm -hmm. is a lesson learned from Collins and, and uh, a positive one that, that's the way it's come out. I think lessons learned more generally, um, we're probably at the moment at the stage of um, using the experience of people who are in the team who have um, got scars and learnt lessons, uh, who can observe what other people uh, have gone through. Uh, I suspect that what we will do is when we come to to narrow into particularly things on the supply chain, commercial, industrial construct and so forth, we will actually use lessons learned as a kind of quality assurance process to evaluate the different options that we're, that we're going through. That will be part of the evaluation, I'm sure. I'm getting nods from the audience, so I must be right. <laughs> yes, Brennan. Yeah, he's got, he's got it. Can I just ask um, David and, and Janice, and, and that was a, a remarkable dissertation where you got your way through a, a minefield of politics and finance and everything else to, to cut to the chase on a couple of key issues. But to what extent, if you actually looked at a new submarine project along a, from, a, from a very early starting point to, a, to an end point with the construction of a, a submarine ready for operations, it sounds like we're at some distance along the way if we actually look at incorporating the lessons learned from acoustic tiles and everything else that you described there um, in a new submarine. So in terms of actually comparing it to how we started with, say, the Collins, how far along the road are we with a, a new submarine? Or are we at all? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first. Um, I th we're in a much better position. I mean, uh, that, that's my judgment. I don't know because I wasn't here at the start of college, so I can't use direct experience to compare the two. But my feeling is uh, that because of two things, really. First of all, we have probably three. We have the experience of operating Collins and the experience we've got from particularly the work that um, we've done with John Coles' in encouragement um, means we have good submarine knowledge that's grown out of that and that knowledge is, is important to have. It's a good body of, part of our body of knowledge. Um, we've learned the lesson on involving the STO right from the start, indeed even before the start actually. Uh, so doing the R&D which, uh, or doing the research which might be <coughs> applied through development and design into a new submarine from a very early stage given that long gestation period. So we're in a better position there. Um, I think we have um, we have opened ourselves to uh, scrutiny and assistance, particularly from the United States Navy, uh, and, and that is good. Expert assistance coming in from that source has been valuable, both in making suggestions, but also in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of providing some assurance that we're doing the right things or indeed not doing the right things. Um, and I think finally, um, we have been in a way fortunate, uh, given the announcements that the previous government made, that if you, if you um, announce that you're going to build 12 new SSKs uh, of a new conventional design uh, and do that in Australia, e even, even if that's just an announcement, even if it's not actually a firm cabinet decision, what happens is you, you're like a magnet. You attract all sorts of people who are interested in doing submarine work. And, they, and, they, and we've had no difficulty getting hold of people who can actually bring their experience to bear. So put all those things together, my feeling is that you're, you're, you're right. We are in a, in a much better position to start this program than um, would have been the case uh, back in the early 1980s. Um, but again, I don't know enough about the early 1980s to be able to be absolutely definitive about that. That's my, that's my feeling. And just to add to that, I think one of the other advantages we have now compared with them is industry that's built submarines uh, and, and operated submarines. So, so back then, uh, going from the Oberon class to the Collins class, I think that that, that, uh, that experience, I think, has positioned us, in, put us in a much better position now. And I think that we've got together as a community uh, with industry, with the submariners and... and uh, and, and researchers to actually run over, over a period of years uh, a number of workshops uh, to look at what, uh, 
what the drivers are, so start to build up that common operating picture so that, in fact, we're all positioning ourselves for a, for a common goal in, in the end, and, and that didn't exist before.